Coming up on Doctype, we're back in the studio and we're thinking outside the box with CSS3 borders. Then, HTML5 has a lot of crazy tags. We'll help you navigate this jungle of markup mayhem. So kick back on the inflatable couch because it's time for Doctype. This episode of Doctype is brought to you by GrooveShark and Barcamp Orlando. I'm Nick Pettit. And I'm Jim Hoskins. And you're watching Doctype. Whether you're a designer that wants to learn a little bit of coding or a developer that thinks everything they make looks like crap, Doctype is here to show you the latest tips, tricks, and tools to help you take your next project to the next level. Well, we're back from our trip to Web Week Miami, settling back into the old studio quite nicely. <laughs> That's right. Uh, it was really awesome to meet all of you who came down to Miami, and it was really cool to hear your feedback on Doctype. We appreciate it. Yeah, but now it's time to get back to work. This week we're talking about CSS3 borders and the new tags in HTML5. Check it out. Borders work best when they're used to reveal the visual structure of a web page. When you make good use of borders, you end up with a really crisp, clean looking design. You have to make sure to use borders sparingly though, because if you don't, you might end up with that whole box within a box within a box look. Now with our safety helmets on, let's look at some of the new additions to borders in CSS3. Border radius is one of my favorite properties that's new in CSS3. It allows you to round off the corners of an element without the use of images. Let's take a look at the syntax. In Mozilla, we use Moz border radius, and in WebKit, we use WebKit border radius. After the property, type in a value in pixels or M's. The higher you set the value, the more curvy the corners will be. If you set the border radius on a square element to a really high value, you can make the curved corners touch one another, which makes the element look like a circle. You can also set curves on individual corners. Let's try setting the border radius on two corners that are opposite one another to create a teardrop effect. This is where the syntax in Mozilla and WebKit differs. In Mozilla, use Moz border radius top left and Moz border radius bottom right. In WebKit, we use WebKit border top left radius and WebKit border bottom right radius. Then, just apply the values to each property. Based on these properties, you can probably guess what the syntax looks like for the other two corners. Border image is another neat CSS3 property, and as the name implies, it allows you to use images as your borders. Here are some of the basics. For this example, we're gonna use this base image. In Mozilla, use Moz border image, and in WebKit, use WebKit border image. The first part is just the path to the image, which probably looks familiar to you. The next four values are the top, right, bottom, and left pixel widths of the border. So for example, if you wanted the left part of the border to be five pixels wide, it would use the leftmost five pixels of the source image. This sounds like a complex idea when explained in words, but it's really easy to understand if you just try it for yourself. Lastly, you can stretch the width and height of the image across the whole element by typing stretch, stretch, or you can repeat the pattern by typing round, round. There's a lot of other properties that are related to border image that I didn't cover here, and I think people sometimes avoid using border images just because it can be so overwhelming. But you should definitely check out the show notes and look at some of the other resources because I think there's a lot of opportunity for innovation here. In episode one of Doctype, I talked about the text shadow property. If you're already familiar with text shadows, then box shadows should also look familiar to you. Here's how it works. In Mozilla, we use Moz box shadow, and in WebKit, we use WebKit box shadow. The first argument is the X offset for the shadow. A positive value will push it to the right, and a negative value will push it to the left. The second argument is the Y offset. Positive is down, and negative is up. The next argument is the blur radius. The higher the value, the fuzzier the shadow will become. And lastly, there's the color. You could use a hexadecimal color here, but I recommend using the RGBA function. That way you can set a color and then dial down the opacity to make the shadow blend in with the background. This tends to produce more realistic results. There is one other thing I'd like to point out. If you add the optional argument inset, you can create an inner shadow. This is good if you want to create a sunken well style effect. Now, I think you already know what I'm going to say here. None of the stuff I just talked about works in Internet Explorer. Unfortunately, that's just the reality of living on the bleeding edge of web technology and working with draft specifications. You could use IE filters, but I think you should just let it be. Remember, it doesn't have to look the same in every browser. Now, next, Jim is going to be talking about HTML5 tags, but first, let's listen to some GrooveShark. 
Groove Shark lets you search for any song and play it instantly. Don't know what you want to listen to? Use Groove Shark Radio. If you hear a song you love, just add it to your favorites and it'll be there every time you log in. You can even share any song with your friends to places like Twitter. Also, don't forget to make playlists of your songs so you can come back and hear them anytime. Check them out at GrooveShark.com. It's all the music you love, all in one place. HTML5 brings us way more than just a fancy new doc type and some cool technologies like video, audio, and canvas. It also brings us a bunch of new tags that allow us to mark up our page in more meaningful ways. Now we can use these HTML tags in our browsers now, but the browsers won't be adding any default styles to it. What it does offer us is some semantic meaning for our document. So if a computer is parsing our code or somebody's looking at our source code, they can figure out the parts of our page and how they relate to each other more easily. It also allows us to code with fewer classes because we can use things like the header tag instead of the header class. Now, presumably in the future, the browsers will be adding some default styles, but we don't really know what they'll look like yet. Now, the first thing you're going to want to do before using any of these elements is declare an HTML5 doc type. Let's take a look. In angle braces, just put an exclamation point in doc type and then the word HTML. This tells the browser that we want to actually use HTML5, and this is called the HTML5 doc type. If you're familiar with other doc types, you'll notice that this one's a lot shorter than the other ones. I think this is one of the big selling points of the doc type, is it's actually easy to remember. Since tables have fallen out of style for doing layout, divs have largely taken their place. Now while this is good, it can lead to div-itis, or divs nested within divs for the purpose of layout. It can be hard to tell what a div is really doing. That's where sections come in handy. A section is used to denote that the content is a distinct section of the page, for instance, the chapters of a book or any other grouped information. Typically, a section will start with a heading, but it is not required. A more specific type of section is an article, but an article should be a fully self-contained piece of information that would make sense outside of the page. Example uses of articles include blog posts, comments, widgets, or forum posts. Articles can be inside of sections, and sections can be inside of articles. Articles can even be inside other articles. Don't just replace all your divs with sections and articles. Articles. If a div is there to provide assistance in styling and layout, or simply doesn't encapsulate a single piece of information, leave it as a div. That's why they're there. Asides are useful for information that's on a tangent to the content around it. That is, it's interesting, but not crucial to the main point. Asides are usually represented by sidebars or pull quotes. They shouldn't be used for parenthetical information, though, because it's usually too relevant to the main point. The header and footer elements allow us to denote content that's not the main content on our page. It should be pretty easy to figure out what the header and footer element should be on your page. You probably already have a div with the class or ID header and footer. Just replace those. Besides the top level header and footer, other parts of the page may also include headers and footers, typically sections or articles. For instance, in a blog index, each post might be in an article with a header wrapped around the title and a footer wrapped around the comment link, permalink, and meta information. The nav element represents a section of the page with links to other pages or sections within the page. Now, not all groups of links are appropriate for the nav tag, usually just the major navigation blocks. One quick note is that our browsers can parse these tags today, but Internet Explorer needs a little bit of help. Before it can read any of these tags, each tag needs to be programmatically generated in JavaScript, and then it'll actually be able to read it. Fortunately, there is a script called the HTML5 shiv that will do this all for you, so you can just start using your tags. Also, browsers don't have any default style for these elements, so it's best to be specific. For instance, some browsers may display something as block, while another one does it as inline. So if you have any weirdness, just say display block or display inline on your tags, and you should be fine. Now there's about two dozen other brand new HTML5 tags that have been introduced, including video, audio, and canvas. We'll be taking a look at those in future episodes of Doctite. If you've never been to a Barcamp event, then Barcamp Orlando is a must. It's an all-day event where the attendees are also the presenters. Before the day gets rolling, anyone can post a presentation topic to the big board with a time and place to go see it. Then, you get to pick the presentations that you want to go see. If this is your first Barcamp, we strongly encourage that you present. And you can talk about anything you want, from technology to art or even just washing your cat. Barcamp Orlando starts at 9 a.m. on April 3rd, 2010, here at Wall Street Plaza in downtown Orlando. To learn more, check out barcamporlando.com. Org. That's it for this week. Let us know what you think in the comments. Also, be sure to check us out at facebook.com slash doctype and follow at doctype TV on Twitter. Also, if you have a question you'd like answered on a future episode of Doctype, send us an email at questions at doctype.tv. 
And if you subscribe via RSS or iTunes, you'll never miss an episode of Doctype, so why not? So until next Tuesday, remember that every great web page starts with Doctype.